The Dogwood Bar here on Division Street in Nashville is a few blocks away from Vanderbilt University. It's many streets that are lined with bars and restaurants. It's a place where college students hang out. And on December 21st of 2019, it's where the victims and their friends and the defendant and his friends were inside. And at 3 a.m., security emptied this bar, sent everyone out onto the sidewalk, and that's when things heated up. Surveillance cameras captured a fight that seemed to draw in numerous people. It's a chaos that both sides agree happened outside of this bar, but described very differently by prosecutor Jan Norman and defense attorney Ken Quillen. It appears they might be speaking to each other, but Mr. Mosley, out of nowhere, punches Sam directly in the head. And not once, not one punch done, but punches him and punches him and punches him and punches him. A guy in a white button-down shirt, I mean, he coolest guy around, looks at his phone, puts it in his pocket, goes over to this scrum of people, comes out with Michael Mosley in a chokehold. Three men were taken to Vanderbilt Hospital for their injuries. Two died after surgery, Clayton Bethard and Paul Trapini. Michael Mosley left the scene after stabbing three people, according to prosecutors, and four days passed before he was apprehended. Authorities found him in a vacant house in Cheatham County, about 30 miles from here. He was taken into custody as a fugitive. His attorneys say that he had contacted an attorney right after this happened and was waiting to hear back from the case detective, reporting from Division Street in Nashville, Julia Janae with Court TV. And now I want to bring in our own Court TV legal correspondent, Julia Janae, who is there in Nashville covering this trial live. I know, Julia, you've been inside the courtroom. Let's start with the courtroom, the gallery. Who is there today and what type of reactions have you seen to the surveillance videos that have been shown? Judge Ashley, the emotion is thick inside of the courtroom and even in the hallway. Right now we're on a break, but what we've seen is in the hallway, some of these uh, parents and people who are connected to these victims coming out unable to watch the things that we've seen inside, clinging to each other outside in the hallway, hugging. It's, it's been a very difficult time, you can tell. For them to have to recount this, relive it, there was even a moment that it seemed to shock them and then even the jury once they see, saw this video it's cell phone video it's really brief but it's someone who saw this happening was recording one of the victims and you can see the blood all over his shirt he's clearly been stabbed but he's walking seemingly normal and then he leans over has both of his hands on his knee you could see that this almost caught members of the family off guard and they quickly uh, were, were putting their heads down not wanting to watch these final moments of one of the victims then it was later shown to the jury but this is something that the prosecution wants to make sure that this uh, this jury understands uh, that, excuse me, I've got something in my throat, <laughs> Judge Ashley. I'm actually going to throw to some of the sound of uh, what happened today in court uh, when we heard from one of the people who was in the defendant's group and then how the prosecution also characterized this incident, uh, that it's not a necessarily something that wasn't a fight, it was a brawl, but she wants to emphasize that this was a certain type of brawl and shouldn't have been escalated. Take a listen. I noticed a group across the street. Uh, I recognized a bunch of them from being guys that were in here uh, in the bar. Um, and it just looked like they were kind of roughhousing with each other across the street. You know, it, it looked, uh, it was like a little huddle. Um, like I said, I couldn't identify everybody across the street because it was, it, was, it was dark out. Um, but I noticed a few of the clothing and I recognized them from being inside. And it just looked, it didn't look like a fight. It looked like a bunch of guys just kind of roughhousing with each other. Um, but the weird thing to me was that everyone's arms were down and it just looked like a bunch of, like a little mosh pit, like shoulder bumping. So I just kind of watched it and uh, a couple moments after I kind of focused in on it, I saw a gentleman run off to the right towards a bar called Chewy's, which is at the corner on their side of the street. Um, and at the same time I saw that gentleman running to my right, his left. Uh, I also witnessed two other gentlemen from the same group um, start to move across the street back towards the dogwood side of the, of the uh, block. Uh, and when I witnessed them, I saw by the time they got to our corner, uh, right at the right outside of our patio fence, uh, I noticed one of them kind of dropped to a knee and then went out of my vision behind the fence. And you will hear 
from all of those people that were outside. You'll hear from all eight of the friends that were out there, and not one of them saw a knife. Not one of them even thought that what was happening could result in their two friends dying and another friend being stabbed in the eye. You'll hear from those people that they don't know anyone else in the group, the people by the SUV, because they run into it too. One of their friends is over there and they go to help their friend and not one of them saw a knife. You'll hear from J.C. Harper, Daniel Sevilla, Sergio Alvarado. None of them saw a knife and not one of them felt that they were in danger because this was supposed to be a fist fight. This was a punch. It was pushing, it was shoving. There's absolutely nothing about this that that one person, Michael Mosley, knew. He was armed with a knife and he stabbed them in the heart, in the chest. A passionate Jan Norman there in openings yesterday, and who we actually heard from before her was David Hangley. He was a bartender that night at the bar, but we also heard today from one of the friends of the defendant, David Sevilla, who uh, talked about being in this fight, and he said that he threw some punches, he was punched himself, and then he left. At first, that the defendant got into his car, but then got out before he drove away. The defense, of course, we expect them, if they get the chance to put on a case, or if they choose to put on a case, uh, that they will be emphasizing this was a fight and that he was defending himself, something that the prosecution isn't necessarily disputing, Judge Ashley. And Michael Mosley, do we know any information about whether or not we can anticipate he's going to testify, Julia? We have not heard anything on the record. Of course, we know that's something they don't have to uh, give to the court. We haven't heard that request or question from the judge and nothing in the court documents that suggests that he is for sure going to take the stand. Likely after the prosecution rests their case, there may be that question in between or the defense will start their case and it may come up at the end. But because of the nature of this case being a self-defense one, you would expect that you need to hear or the jurors will in fact want to hear from the defendant on whether or not he feared for his life. But of course, he is under no obligation to testify on his own behalf. Right. And I know some of the legal analysts have been commenting the issue with him testifying is he might open the door to some of his criminal history and things coming in that perhaps they had anticipated wouldn't otherwise come in. Talk if you would please today, Julia, the prosecution called their very first witness, uh, Emma Yoder. And I know that's the one, the witness, who's been described as someone that the defendant was trying to flirt with on the night of the fight. The fight occurred at, you know, 2.48, 2.52 a.m. What stood out to her about her testimony to you? Oh, Emma Yoder was definitely a strong first witness. I don't think she was the first witness the prosecution was expecting. They had another person that they had in place, but she really was able to show this jury who the victims are because she'd known them for so long. They were graduates of Battleground Academy, a private school where many of the people who were inside of that bar had graduated from, and they were having something of a, a class reunion, uh, informal one at that bar during the Christmas break. Take a listen to how she described the incident that she witnessed there on the ground. Are you friends with Sam Folks? I am. How well do you know Sam Folks? Um, pretty well. He actually um, dated one of my best friends a lot throughout high school. Um, and so obviously we hung out a lot because of that. Um, and um, I just love him to death. He would always just call me Yoder. Um, the first time I ever met him, Yoder, um, and still calls me that to that day, to this day. Um, he, again, is just such an amazing person. Um, you know, always has everyone's back. Um, he's uh, coaching baseball now, so I mean, he obviously just loves people. Mm -hmm. um, and getting to kind of be that role model and. Um, that's just exactly what I see him doing now, you know. Um, 
but yeah, we were really close all throughout high school, and he's someone who I get really excited to always see to this day. Is he the kind of person who picks fights? No, ma'am. Have you ever known him to carry a weapon? No. Is he the kind of person who would goad somebody into getting into a fight or anything like that? No, ma'am. A court is now on their witness number five being cross-examined. The lead detective in this case, Zachariah Beavis, and I understand that he's actually back on the stand now, Judge Ashley. Right.